Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about acceleration. How does acceleration work? Why is it important? Why do we care? You might say, acceleration sounds kind of boring, but let me assure you, one of Einstein's most famous thought experiments, which directly led to the theory of general relativity, which involves uh, gravitational fields and black holes, it came about from a thought experiment involving acceleration of somebody in a moving elevator. So if it's good enough for Einstein to ponder and think about and lead to amazing things, I think it's good enough for us. Let's dive into the concept of acceleration. Acceleration in a nutshell is when your velocity, we've already talked about velocity in the past, changes over some period of time. I'll say that one more time. It's when our velocity changes in some way, shape, or form over some period of time. So here's a good example of acceleration. Here is a video of a rocket sled. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, they would strap pilots into a rocket sled and accelerate them from rest to a very high velocity to see how the human body handles acceleration. Because when we are accelerated, we're either pushed into our chair or we're thrown forward. So here's a rocket uh, sled, literally a rocket attached to the back, accelerating forward and pushing the subject back into their chair. And this is where Einstein got the idea that acceleration can sort of fool us into thinking that we're in a gravitational field and there might be some connection there. And that was his famous thought experiment. All right, here's another video, again, of a, another situation involving one of these rocket sleds. This time, instead of speeding up and pushing us into the chair, they turned it backwards and actually they slowed the chair down very, very rapidly. So again, he's pushed into his chair, but you can see him being thrown sort of, sort of uh, backwards, essentially decelerating to a stop. Now, in both of these examples, you can see how the face and the, and the muscles and the skin are kind of like pushed and distorted as the rapid deceleration acceleration or acceleration takes place. All right, so we've seen two examples of acceleration. One of them is when we start at rest or start at some velocity and we're accelerated and speeding up in some direction, we call that an acceleration. But we also have the concept of slowing down and that's what we call in everyday language a deceleration. In science, we actually all call it all acceleration. Acceleration is when you're speeding up in the direction of motion. Deceleration, we just simply call it a negative acceleration. So if you ever see a negative acceleration, it just means that you're braking or you're slowing down. All right, here's another example of acceleration. This is a, a crash test dummy, right, for testing automobiles. So you can see the car is moving forward, driving at a high rate of speed, everything seems fine, and then suddenly it hits an obstacle and our speed changes. It changes from a high rate of speed, effectively going down to zero, uh, in a very short period of time, so our velocity changed. Now notice as you watch it that the uh, dummy inside wants to keep moving forward until it collides with the dashboard. And that's another law of physics we'll talk about later, the law of inertia, which basically says that an object in motion, it wants to continue moving in the direction of travel at all times unless some other force acts to stop it, right? In this case, the car and the crash test dummy was moving very fast in one direction, but as the car came to a rapid stop, the, the body, the dummy inside, didn't know about the car stopping. It just wants to keep moving, and that's why we're thrown forward when we rapidly brake. Again, braking is called an acceleration. It's just a negative acceleration. All right, here is one of my favorite things in the world. I worked on the space shuttle program for many years. Uh, this is called uh, a launch of the space shuttle, right? So the shuttle is sitting motionless on the launch pad, a velocity of zero, and then when we ignite the boosters, we launch, uh, we go to lift off there, and so we're accelerated rapidly to a high rate of speed over a period of uh, eight or nine minutes is the entire launch profile. You go from zero up to orbital velocity, uh, which is you know 17,500 miles an hour, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, which is incredible to think about. All of that energy has to come from somewhere. It comes from the energy of the chemical reaction of the boosters that are on the bottom of the ship. That's where we get the energy to accelerate the ship to orbital speed. I think that is, is worth letting that number bake into our mind just a little bit more because I kind of blow past it. Orbital velocity is 17,500 miles per hour. If you don't like miles, that's fine. About 28,000 kilometers per hour. So you're literally going from a standstill to that velocity over a period of about eight minutes. That's an incredible amount of energy released. That's why we need such big boosters to release that energy and accelerate from a velocity of zero to orbital velocity. So we're accelerating the whole time, changing our velocity over a period of time. 
Now here is a neat video because as the uh, Apollo astronauts landed on the moon, they needed a way to get off of the moon to go back and dock with the orbiting spacecraft around the moon and then return back to Earth. So this is a launch from the surface of the moon. On the local uh, frame of reference, they're traveling at zero velocity. And then, of course, the booster, the very, very small booster in the lunar gravity ignites, which you can ver very, can't even really see the plane move it there. But it, it, it accelerates the craft up, which carries the two astronauts that landed on the moon back up into lunar orbit. So accelerating from a velocity of zero again to an orbital velocity for the moon and then coming back home. Now, I have to stop myself and just talk about velocity for just a second. Because when we say a, a velocity of zero, when the shuttle is on the launch pad, I say a velocity of zero. Well, actually, the Earth is rotating very fast. And then the Earth is going around the sun very fast. And then the sun is going around the galaxy. The whole solar system is going around the galaxy very fast. And our entire galaxy is also moving very fast. So we're never really at rest. We're always moving. It, 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 one of the main things Einstein taught us was we need to talk about what are we measuring our frame of reference to. So when I say the shuttle is starting from rest, I mean with respect to the ground. And when it's going at 17,000 miles an hour in orbit, it's with respect to the ground and so on. So we have to have a frame of reference for any motion. All right, so uh, I wanna give a couple of additional examples. Here is a bungee jumper jumping from a height. Notice that when they jump off at the very top, they're moving very, very slowly, and then they start moving faster and faster as they're accelerating down due to gravity, moving faster and faster, that's acceleration. And then as the bungee cord starts to get tight and slow them down, again, they're accelerating, but it's like a negative acceleration. They're, they're uh, accelerating the other way, so to speak, as part of that fall there. And then here's an image of a waterfall with the water droplets. Again, coming over the top, they move faster and faster and faster as the water goes down towards the ground. Now, water is an interesting case because everything as it drops goes faster and faster due to gravitational acceleration. However, water droplets frequently sort of slow down and, and, and kind of reach what we call terminal velocity. So everything accelerates due to gravity in the same way, but if they have a very large surface area like water droplets or leaves, then the air resistance will slow them down and, and prevent them from accelerating more. So even when you jump out of an airplane, you don't continue accelerating forever. Eventually you'll get a high enough speed where the wind will stop your acceleration towards the ground. Now, the concept of acceleration is intimately tied to what we call uh, you know, uh, g-force or the force of gravity here uh, on the Earth. Everything on the Earth, when you drop it, accelerates towards the ground at the same rate. So we're gonna learn later that the concept of acceleration and the concept of forces acting on a body are very, very, very closely related. In fact, we'll talk about Newton's second law F equals MA, force equals mass times the acceleration. So because everything accelerates on Earth at the same rate, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, uh, 9.8 meters per second squared, that's the main thrust of the lesson we're gonna talk about, we call that one G of acceleration. So if, I, if I'm under the gravitational um, uh, force of one G of gravitational acceleration, right? if I go to another planet in the solar system with more or less gravitational force, then of course I won't weigh as much. So for instance, if we define the Earth's acceleration due to gravity and thus the force of gravity to be one G, then if we go to the moon, how much gravity will the moon have? One convenient way of measuring it is in terms of how many Gs? So on the moon, it turns out to be 0 0.16 Gs. So less than 20%, because 0 0.2 would be exactly 20% of one G, less than 20% uh, of, your, uh, of your body weight would be what you would weigh on the moon. And so when you see the astronauts bouncing and bouncing on the moon, that's why there's less gravitational force and therefore less gravitational acceleration. 0 0.16 of one Earth G. Uh, force of gravity or gravitational acceleration on the moon. What about Mars? We all have dreams. Humanity has dreams of going to Mars and exploring another planet. How much gravity is there? Well, Mars is bigger than the moon, but it's not as large as Earth, so it should be in the middle. The acceleration due to gravity on Mars is about 0 0.38 Gs. 0 0.38 Gs. And what does that mean? You weigh 0.38, so just a little bit less than half, a little bit less than 40% of your body weight on Earth. So you would be able to jump and get around pretty easily on Mars, uh, but you know, it wouldn't be as easy as the moon, right? What about Venus? Venus is a planet we don't talk about too much. It's actually very similar in size to the Earth, uh, but it's 
scorchingly hot there, and that's due to the atmosphere mostly full of carbon dioxide, which traps a lot of the solar energy from radiating out into space, and so it's very, very hot on Venus. But it's very similar in size to Earth, a little bit smaller than Earth. What is the gravity on Venus? 0.9 Gs. That means if I actually were to travel to Venus, if I could, which I can't because it's too hot, but if I could, I would feel pretty close to the same weight that I feel here, 0.9 of my body weight uh, that I have on Earth. All right, let's crank it up a notch. Let's go to Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is an interesting animal because there's no solid surface of Jupiter, all right? So what we do, it's a gas giant. So what we do is we say, let's pretend this, the cloud tops of Jupiter is really where the surface is. And all of the mass inside of Jupiter is, is the mass of Jupiter, but let's pretend it's a solid surface. How much gravitational force would I feel on Jupiter in terms of Gs? The gravitational acceleration there would be 2.54 Gs. 2.54 Gs means just a little bit more than two and a half of Earth's gravitational acceleration, which means two and a half times uh, 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 my body weight was, would be what I would feel on Jupiter. So I would, if I, you know, had a, a, a weight of 100 pounds, then I would weigh, you know, uh, 250 pounds. Or if I had a weight of a, a, a something else, I'd multiply by 2.5, two and a half, just a little bit more than two and a half. So you would have a hard time getting up on the off the couch if you were able to sit in some sort of space station at that uh, area of Jupiter there. All right, let's go bigger than Jupiter. What's bigger than Jupiter? Let's talk about the sun. The sun is much more massive than any of our planets. Of course, how much gravitational acceleration do you think there would be on the surface of the sun? It turns out it's very close to about 28 Gs. So 28 times However much you weigh here, that's how much you would weigh there. And if you drop an object near the surface of the sun, it would accelerate with an acceleration 28 times higher uh, than uh, it does here. Now, of course, the sun has no surface either, no solid surface. So we just draw a shell around the top layer of the solar atmosphere and say, okay, what would be the solar, the gravity there? And a, and a shell there if it were solid, and that's what that number would be. That's kind of impressive to think about. I don't think I could physically get up off the couch. Uh, if, I, if I could sit on a couch on the surface of the sun. Now, for comparison, when you uh, go in a roller coaster, right, and you're pushed into your seat on a roller coaster, a, a very run-of-the-mill roller coaster can hit two or three Gs, no problem, for short periods of time. Super, super intense roller coasters, maybe four or five Gs for short periods of time. If you're flying airplanes, like fighter airplanes, and you pull back on the stick and you're like, having a hard time breathing, maybe you could get up to nine Gs for a short period of time. And I mean, maybe for 10 seconds or so. Because what happens is the blood drains out of your head and then you, your brain doesn't work. So there's a limit to how many Gs a human can actually withstand. And it turns out that we've had, uh, we can put people in centrifuges and spin them around. For short periods of time, you can go above nine Gs, but uh, I don't know what the actual limit is, but it's not much more than that. But in actual fighter planes today, about nine Gs for short periods of time is doable. So 28 Gs in the sun is basically impossible for a human to essentially move around and survive. All right, now let's go bigger than that. Of course, we could talk about black holes. You know, let's not, let's not go that far. What would be something more massive than the sun, but maybe not quite so bad as a black hole? Well, there's a type of star called a white dwarf that I wanna to talk to you about. A white dwarf is a type of star that we would have if we took our sun, the, ma the mass of our sun, and squeezed it down to make it more dense so that our solar mass actually was about the size of the Earth. And as you know, the Earth is much, much, much smaller than the sun. So if we could take the sun somehow and squeeze it down to be the size of the Earth, then there would be a lot more concentrated mass, a lot more gravity. What would be the g-force at the surface, quote unquote, of a white dwarf star? And the answer to that is about 100,000 Gs. 100,000 times the force of gravity, 100,000 times your body weight, you are literally a pancake on the ground, you're completely unsurvivable. And then black holes are even more in crazy and intense than that because a white, a white dwarf, of course, doesn't have as much gravity as a black hole. And just to kind of like share something interesting uh, with you, uh, if you can find the star Sirius in the sky, which is the uh, brightest star in the sky, if you can find the constellation Orion and look just a little bit near Orion, you'll find a very, very bright star, which is called Sirius. Now, that's one of 
two stars that are actually orbiting each other. And uh, the bright one that you see is just a, a star, but there's a companion star to it that's too dim to see with your eyes. But if you can find Sirius, then orbiting that thing at a very short distance away is a white dwarf. And a white dwarf, again, has 100,000 times roughly, give or take, the, the gravitational force or the acceleration of what you would feel on Earth. So the Sirius star and its companion is about 8.6 light years away in the constellation Canis Major, which is very near Orion. So I think it's neat to go outside to be able to look at a star and then say, hey, right next to that one is that thing called a white dwarf, which is almost a black hole, essentially. If it was a little more massive, it'd be a black hole, but it's pretty impressive in its own way. All right, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to get to the board and more and more detailed way show you and tell you what acceleration is so we can appreciate this all a little bit more. All right, so let's roll up our sleeves and talk about acceleration. I promise you it's not difficult to understand and it's actually, I think, quite interesting. So the concept of acceleration, I think we all have some experience with it because we drive cars and things and we kind of know generally what acceleration is. It's a change in velocity over some period of time. Now this triangle, don't get scared by it, the triangle just means some change. This Literally you just replace this with the word change instead of writing the word change out. Now the thing I want to impress with you in the beginning of this that I wish somebody would have told me and emphasized a little more, I'm gonna tell you. Okay, so any which way you can change your velocity over time leads to an acceleration, all right? But remember, velocity is a vector, right? This is a vector quantity. What did we say a vector was? We said a vector in a previous lesson, a vector is any quantity that has a magnitude, a strength, and a direction. When I'm traveling at some velocity, I'm going this direction at this speed, or this direction at this speed. It has a magnitude and a direction associated with it, okay? So if I need to change my velocity over some period of time, then that means I really have two different options. An acceleration can be done by changing the speed over time, right? That's what we know, right? Because when we're sitting in the car and we hit the, we hit the gas or the accelerator that we're pushed into our chair, that we're changing our speed and that, that's an acceleration. But we can also get an acceleration uh, by changing the direction of motion over time. Now let me, let me just talk about this for a second because this is, we're gonna to get to this in future lessons. I'll do other lessons on it, okay? But this is actually critically important, so I wanna emphasize it. Velocity is not just a number. Velocity is a number associated with some direction. So when I'm telling you in words that to make an acceleration happen, it's you have to make your velocity change, but velocity itself is really two parts. It's how fast you're going and it's what direction you're moving. Then there is literally two different ways to change your velocity. One way is to hold your direction constant and speed up or slow down. That's what we're all familiar with. But another way to change your velocity is to keep your speed the same, but change the direction of motion. This is why when you're turning a car and you're not accelerating, but you just kind of like turn the car, you feel some kind of like force pushing you. So there's an acceleration happening in circular motion because not because the speed is changing, but because the direction of the speed, uh, the direction of the velocity is changing. So there's two different ways to make the acceleration. You can either speed up or slow down in the same direction, or you can hold the speed constant, but just change the direction. I, I, I dare you, when next time you're driving a car, just don't change your speed, just grab the wheel and go left, right, left, and you're gonna start feeling forces on yourself because there are accelerations acting on you just by changing the direction of your velocity vector. That's very important to understand because when we get to, to gravitation and other things with circular motion, we call it centripetal acceleration when the acceleration's pointing uh, toward the center, and the reason is because of this, because you can get an acceleration just by changing your direction also. All right, so let's get a little more mathematical. I promise you it will not be difficult to understand. How do we calculate acceleration? Well, first of all, we have to define something called the average acceleration, and it's a vector. This arrow means it's a vector, right? And it's some change in velocity, which is a vector, that's why there's an arrow over there, divided by some change in time. This is what I told you in words. Acceleration is a change in velocity over time. Acceleration, average acceleration, is a change in velocity over time. It's just that this thing is a vector, so we can make it change by speeding up over time or slowing down, or by just changing its direction over time. Both will lead to some kind of acceleration. Now this is an average because it's over some time period. So if I 
look at a snapshot in time five seconds apart and I calculate my acceleration, that would be an average over that two periods of time that I, uh, I'm talking about there. Now, if I want to blow this up further or look at it more, what does it mean to have a change in velocity? Well, it means I take my final velocity, right, uh, which I can say is some vector arrow, right, and I can subtract away the initial velocity, right, then that's literally the change in velocity. And then I have some time period, tf minus ti. So literally all you do is you say, what's my velocity uh, when I finished moving? And then what was my initial velocity? I subtract them. That's the change in the velocity that happened. And then I divide by how many seconds it takes. This is the final time stamp and the initial time stamp. This is the, the delta t, the, the total amount of time that elapsed right here. Now never forget that when you subtract two velocity numbers, the units of velocity is meters per second. The units of this velocity is meters per second. So when I subtract them, the unit I get for velocity, any velocity, is going to be uh, in meters per second. So the unit on the top of this fraction is just meters per second. Um, and the unit on the bottom of this, when I take seconds minus seconds, is just seconds. So when I calculate some change in velocity and divide it by some time, what I'm doing is I'm taking a unit that's already in meters per second, but then I'm dividing by seconds. So it's meters per second per second. So I'm going to show you the units of acceleration in just a minute, but in your mind, every time you see it, I want you to think it's meters per second per second. It's how many meters per second I'm speeding up or slowing down every second, because it's a change in my velocity every second. Right? So I know you all probably know the units are meters per second squared. That's where the squared comes from, but I don't like saying it like that because it, it doesn't feel intuitive. Instead of saying meters per second squared, say meters per second per second. And then it's reminding you that I'm increasing my meters per second every single second. Change in velocity over time. So what would these units look like? It's not uh, rocket science. What I would do is I would take the meters per second on the top, right, uh, for the units. What I would do is I would take the meters, instead of writing it like a slash here, I'm going to say meters per second on the top, but I'd draw a big division fraction bar and put seconds on the bottom. So it's meters per second per second. But this is like a fraction divided by seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it as meters per second on the top, but this seconds, I'm going to write it as seconds over one on the bottom. So it'll be a fraction divided by a fraction. And as you might remember from math, any fraction division turns into multiplication and you take the bottom fraction and flip it over like this. So meters per second per second is exactly the same thing mathematically as meters per second times one over seconds because any fraction divided by any other fraction flip and multiply. And so I get when I multiply meters times the number, this is one here, then I get meters on the top and then second times second is second squared. So the units of acceleration that you see anytime you, anytime, you see, it could be uh, meters per second squared. It could be kilometers per second squared. It could be miles per second squared. It could be miles per minute squared. That's a weird unit, but you could do it. Any distance unit uh, 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 and any time unit can be mixed to make an acceleration. Light years is a unit of distance. You could have light years per second squared. It's a crazy unit, but you could do it. Astronomical units, the distance from the Earth to the sun. You could say astronomical units per second squared. Sure, but nobody uses that meters per second squared. But in your mind, I want you to say meters per second per second. It's telling you how much I'm speeding up every second or how much I'm slowing down every second. That is what the fundamental thing is actually telling you, how much speed you gain or lose every second. All right. Now I need to talk a little bit about the signs of acceleration. We looked at the rocket sled. Right? When the person was at rest and the rocket was behind them, pushing them in, in the direction of uh, a travel, you are said to be accelerating in the direction of travel, speeding up in the direction of travel. We call that a positive acceleration. But in the direction of travel, if you begin slowing down, like braking, like at the rocket sled braking or either braking at a red light, if you're, moving in a, if you're moving in a direction of travel but slowing down, we call it a negative acceleration. So the way to kind of graph it and talk about it is we can draw an xy axis, right? And I promise you this is not going to be difficult to understand, but I want to make sure that you do understand that, for instance, in the x direction, like in, in, the, in the case of driving a car, I can drive this direction and I can speed up in the direction of travel. And so if I uh, accelerate in this direction, I call this a positive acceleration in the positive x direction. But I can have an acceleration arrow pointed in the other way, which would represent slowing down negative acceleration. So if you ever see 
uh, if you ever see a negative acceleration, it just means that relative to the positive direction, I'm actually accelerating the other way, which means I'm slowing down. Rel it just means you're slowing down relative to the positive sense of whatever it is you're talking about. And we can do the same thing with up and down, because we know that everything that I drop always accelerates down towards the ground. Now, we could say down is positive, but that would be a little weird. Usually we say up is positive and down is negative. So actually, gravitational acceleration, we usually put a minus sign to remind us that it's always acting down. So what we can do is we can say that in the up direction, the positive y direction, this is called a positive acceleration. But any accelerations acting down towards, towards the ground, or maybe even below the ground, if you have a big tunnel here or something, this is called negative acceleration. I remember when I first started learning physics that uh, negative numbers tripped me up and I, I was confused. What does this mean? Okay, think of it like temperature. Nobody has a problem thinking about temperature. It makes sense because the freezing point of water is zero Celsius. So if I tell you that it's one degree below zero or negative one Celsius, what does it mean? It just means I'm going the other way down below the zero point Assuming positive numbers go one direction, I'm going the other way, one unit below zero. So for temperature, it makes intuitive sense. For velocity, one positive direction would be one way, negative would be the opposite direction. For acceleration, it's the same thing. If I have a positive acceleration, it means I'm speeding up in one direction. A negative acceleration means I'm slowing down in, in the uh, relative to the positive direction I'm traveling in. So braking, in general, is negative acceleration. Now, I keep saying that acceleration is meters per second per second. I want you to say that again, meters per second per second. So now is where we um, actually tackle that. Let's say, let's say that you have some initial velocity, which is zero meters per second, right? And let's say that you're accelerating at the rate of two meters per second squared. What does this actually mean? You see this kind of thing in physics problems, you know, or even just science problems. And what does it mean exactly? Well, what it means is if you were to construct a table, this is what you would actually have. On the table, you would have the time measured in seconds. I'm picking seconds because it's all in terms of seconds here. And then over here, there'd be some velocity. Now the acceleration is two meters per second squared, which never changes. I'm never changing my acceleration. The acceleration is fixed. But that means that every second that clicks by, I'm gaining an additional two meters per second. What this means is two meters per second gained every second. Two meters per second of velocity gained every second. So after the first second, I'm going faster. After the next second, I'm going even faster. After the next second, going either even faster. Every second that ticks by, that's how much faster I'm going. So initially, at time zero, I'm going zero uh, meters per second because at zero, you can see uh, the initial velocity is zero meters per second. Now, after the first second ticks by, how fast am I going? Well, two meters per second per second. Then after the first second ticks by, my new velocity is now two meters per second. And now I am traveling faster than I was before. Now, after the next second ticks by, I am accelerating at a rate of two meters per second every single second. And of course, I can't even count, sorry. This is the number two, so two seconds. So now I'm traveling at four meters per second because I add another two meters per second onto it. After the next second ticks by, I'm now traveling at six meters per second. Every second that goes by, my velocity has increased by this number. So the acceleration is just telling you how much speed you increase by every second. Now, I told you in the beginning of this lesson that you can get an acceleration by speeding up or slowing down over time, but you can also get an acceleration by changing direction over time. What we're focusing on in this lesson is just the first one, speeding up and slowing down. I'm gonna conquer changing direction later when we get to circular motion. We'll talk about why that leads to an acceleration. Now we're focusing only on speeding up or slowing down, and you can see that I am speeding up uh, as time goes on. So if you could draw this, if you could just draw a quick little picture, then uh, at time zero, the ball isn't moving at all, so zero meters per second. But one second later, it's got some velocity here, right? Two meters per second. But then uh, another second later, when we're here, it's moved over here and its velocity is even bigger. So the arrow is longer. You see, no arrow means no velocity. Small arrow means small velocity. 
longer arrow means longer velocity. Now I have to get way over here because see, I'm traveling faster, so it's it's moved farther. And then maybe over here, it's something like an even longer arrow here. So this is like two meters per second. I guess I'll write it two meters per second. This is four meters per second, and this is six meters per second. So if you actually could watch it, it would be like this. It would be like, it would be really fast over there. And that is a constant acceleration where your velocity is changing every single second. Now I picked that example on purpose first because it's easy for us to imagine accelerating in the same direction we're moving. Now let's do the same thing where I'm moving in one direction, but my acceleration is negative, which means I'm really braking. Let's see how that would look. And I promise you, it will be very simple to understand just like this. Let's take the example of, uh, let's say that I give you that the initial velocity of some particle or some car or whatever is three meters per second. But my acceleration is no longer positive. My acceleration is actually negative one meters per second squared. What does this physically mean? It means that every second that ticks by, I'm losing or reducing my velocity by one meter per second, every second. So I go down by one meter per second. Then another second ticks by. My velocity then goes down by another meter per second. So I'm slowing down at that rate. That's what that means. Now it's easier to understand with a table of value. So what we'll do is we'll say time in seconds and we have velocity over here and we'll do the exactly the same situation. So at zero, at time is equal to zero, what is my velocity? Well, I'm telling you the initial velocity, which means that time zero is three meters per second. All right, that's my starting point. One second later clicks by, now the clock reads one second, and this tells me that I've lost speed by one meter per second per second. And that means my new speed is two meters per second. Notice it's still positive because I was going fast in one direction, and now I'm still going in that direction, I'm just going one meter per second slower. Now, after one more second ticks by, I've lost an additional one meter per second, so now I'm only traveling this fast. Now let's see what happens at the three minute mark, at the three second mark. I now have to lose one more meter per second, but at this exact moment in time, I'm motionless. So you see what's gonna actually happen? You're moving this way, you're slowing down, and then you're gonna actually turn around. This is the turnaround point, because at the next moment in time, at four seconds, what does it mean? I need to lose another meter per second. So what is zero minus one? If I have to lose one more meter per second, now my new velocity is negative one meters per second. And then your brain explodes because you look at negative one meter per second and you say, what does that mean? Okay, all it means is positive velocities are this way and negative velocities are that way. So it means the particle initially started off moving this way, but slowed down, and then it started moving backwards at a, initially here at a rate of one meter per second, but the negative sign means it's going the other way. Okay, so negative accelerations can turn you around and start moving you in the other direction. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Let's take it one more second into the future. What will be my new velocity? I need to go down by another meter per second, so it's negative two meters per second is my, my new and final velocity. I could keep going uh, if I wanted to, but I'm, I'm done. Now let's draw a picture of this. All right, initially, the particle is moving at three meters per second. Now the positive sign, there's an implied positive here. If you, if you think of positive x to the right and negative x to the left, it means that there's a large arrow here at three meters per second. That's initially how it's going. But then in the next snapshot in time, I now I have now slowed down because I'm decelerating. So now the arrow is a little bit shorter and this is two meters per second. All right, now uh, I'm here. And then I go to this little moment of time I'm gonna to try to make it a little bit closer right here. Now it's one meter per second, which is right here, one meter per second. Notice the arrows are getting smaller because I'm slowing down. But then when I get to the three second mark, I guess I'll put the, the thing right here, there's no arrow at all. And so this is uh, right here, this is zero meters per second. So let me do something, let me color these in so that we don't get confused with zero and what my little marble looks like. So this is zero meters per second, so it stops. But you know, it doesn't, it doesn't stop decelerating there. Uh, you know, in a car, you know, in a car, we think that when we reach a stop, it's over because we hit the brake and, and we're, not, uh, we're not doing anything anymore. Well, when, once we reach a stop at a red light, because we have to stop, we're no longer accelerating anymore. The experiment's over. But in this example, I'm continuing to decelerate. I'm just 
basically it turns into an acceleration in the other direction. So what ends up happening is the ball then turns around. And then it, one second later, after it stopped, it reaches this position right here with a velocity that's this direction. So my arrow goes the other way of negative one meters per second. And then one second later, uh, it reaches maybe this position right here with an arrow the same length as this one, something like this, I'm trying to make it the same length. It may not be quite right. Maybe a little bit shorter, something like this, negative two meters per second. So start off fast, go to a stop, and then begin to accelerate the other way. This, de this uh, negative acceleration, which we call deceleration in everyday language, it continues until you say it's over or until you know your experiment's over or whatever. But as long as you're accelerating or decelerating, you continue increasing or decreasing your velocity or, de or increasing it in the other direction forever. Now, I have to stop for a second because when I was young, I thought, I want to build a spaceship. I want to go to you know, Uranus, <laughs> or I want to go to another star system. So I got to go really, really fast. So what I'll do is I'll just build a ship that accelerates all the time. It's great. There's, there's a small problem. You see, I keep saying that if you accelerate or decelerate, it keeps happening forever. Like in this experiment, the particle would keep getting faster and faster forever. What actually is going to happen is once you get near the speed of light, you're not going to be able to accelerate anymore. You cannot accelerate a massive particle like a marble or a car or a spaceship using any known physics that we know about past the speed of light. What will actually happen is you'll keep putting more energy into it, like a bigger nuclear reactor or a bigger laser or whatever it is, more antimatter, whatever it is you're trying to do to propel yourself, you're going to have to put more and more and more into it, but your velocity will just get, it'll stop accelerating as much. It'll go a little bit more, a little bit more. It'll be diminishing returns to the point where you never can get through the actual light barrier. Now I'll do a whole lesson about that later. Just keep in mind that when I say it accelerates forever, I'm ignoring the real reality that we cannot go and approach the speed of light and go beyond the speed of light. All right, so we've done a couple of examples with accelerating and even decelerating in the X direction. Now we need to talk a little bit more detail about acceleration due to gravity. We already compared gravitational acceleration to other planets, Jupiter, Saturn, or not Saturn, Jupiter, the sun, uh, white dwarf, and things like this. Now we have to put a little more numbers. We said it was so many Gs, so many Gs. Well, it turns out that a G is a unit of acceleration, and it's 9.8 meters per second squared. But because gravity acts down, remember in my drawing, I said, uh, positive acceleration this way, negative acceleration this way, positive acceleration up, negative acceleration down. Just to keep track of the signs, really it's a negative 9.8 meters per second squared, and actually it's not exactly 9.8 either. It's 9.81 with more decimals after it. Now in almost every calculation you and I would ever do, 9.8 is fine. If you want to use 9.81, that's fine too. You never need any more digits beyond that for any more accuracy. But I just wanted to let you know, it's not exactly 9.8. It does, the, the decimals do go beyond that. So it's, it's not exactly 9.8. All right, this means, the negative sign means that gravity uh, acceleration acts downward. And that's because gravity always acts downward at least uh, in the surf near the surface of our planet, ignoring dark energy or anything else that we can talk about some other time, gravitational force acts in one direction and we call up positive and we call it down negative. So that's what we want to talk about there. And we've already talked a little bit about uh, the videos. We looked at a bungee jumper. Notice how when they jump, they're accelerating down. And then when the bungee grabs them, then they begin to slow their fall to break their fall. Same thing with the waterfall going down, accelerates down. Now, any object you drop is going to accelerate down. Now, things like paper eventually will reach a terminal velocity because they have a, if they have a very high surface area with a very low weight, then the air can sort of like balance out the gravitational uh, uh, force there and prevent you from accelerating further. But for most objects, you would just calculate that you would ignore air resistance and you would just say it continues accelerating down forever. Again, you can't go faster than the speed of light. So that, there's always that. But in general, that's what we're doing. So without air resistance, everything falls at the same acceleration, 9.8 meters per second down. So what does that look like in terms of a table like this? Well, once you know what acceleration is, it behaves exactly the same way. For instance, if I dropped an object and kept track of the time after I dropped it and measured its, uh, this, its uh, velocity in meters per second, then what would it look like? What would it look like? 
Well, when I drop it, we say time is zero. So this is zero seconds. And so it has zero uh, velocity, meters per second. In other words, as soon as I drop it, it's not moving at all. But 9.8 meters per second squared means 9.8 meters per second per second. So every second that goes by, my velocity has increased in the downward direction by almost 10 meters per second, 9.8. I wish it was exactly 10 because it would make it so much easier, but 9.8. So that means after one second in the future, my velocity is negative 9.8 meters per second. Again, the negative sign just means I'm traveling down instead of up. Now, if I look at one more second in the future, my velocity needs to be, again, 9.8 meters per second increased, but in the down direction. So that's a negative 19.6 uh, meters per second. So you just take the previous number and you subtract another 9.8 and you get a bigger negative number. After the third second, if you take this and subtract away again, or think of it as adding if you want, it doesn't matter to me, the answer is going to be negative 29. 0.4 meters per second. Now think about how fast this is. 20, almost 30 meters every second. After just a few seconds of free fall, if you drop a rock from a tall building and you have enough time so it doesn't hit the ground, that thing is cooking before it gets very far away from your hand. 30 meters per second is no joke, okay? Now what about one second later after that? Negative 39.2 meters per second. Same deal. 39.2 meters per second. Very, very fast. Almost 40 meters per second. All right, um, so that's what it means when we have up and down, and uh, this is what it means to accelerate in a downward direction. It just means my velocity is getting uh, higher and higher. As I drop this marker, it starts at rest, but then it rapidly is ex it's accelerating and moving faster the longer I let it drop. Now here's an interesting fact. I'll do a whole separate video on one day. Interestingly, if you take and ignore air resistance and take any two objects and drop them, they will always all accelerate at the same rate of 9.8 meters per second squared downward. They will always accelerate at the same rate. So if I take a marker like this and a really heavy rock, like could be a many, many kilos or pounds, and drop them, ignore air resistance, they will fall at exactly the same rate and hit the ground. That is very weird when you think about it because the, the rock would be very heavy. I mean, I could take a car, I could take a bulldozer and drop it and it would hit the same gra uh, 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 the ground at the same time as the marker. In fact, they did this experiment on the moon. That's the best place you can do it to ignore air resistance. So if you look, you can see that they're dropping, the astronaut is dropping uh, a feather in one hand and a hammer in the other uh, hand. Now I know that it's hard to see, but when you look carefully, you can see that they both fall at exactly the same rate and hit the lunar ground at the same time because Everything accelerates at the same rate under gravitational acceleration. Now here's the weird part. Why does that happen? If I drop a rock, we know the rock has more force of gravity. So why doesn't it hit the ground first? I mean, the marker is very light. It doesn't hit the ground. It doesn't push on my hand very much. So if I have a rock and I have a marker, then what, and, the, and the rock definitely has more force pushing it down, why doesn't it hit the ground first? Why doesn't it just accelerate faster? That's a huge mystery. Einstein pondered that for a long time. Many people have, including Newton. Why? Galileo even. Why does that happen? Okay, here is the, uh, the answer in a nutshell, and I'll do a complete lesson on it one day in the future. It is true that the rock has more force of gravity pulling it down. This is true. But at the same time, it also has more inertia, which means it is harder to move the rock. If you were to take the rock in space, anything with more mass and try to push it, it's gonna take more effort to just to move it at all. Now the marker has less force of gravity acting on it, but it's easier to move. And those two effects exactly cancel each other so that everything falls at exactly the same rate in a gravitational field. Even if you go to the sun or anywhere else, this will happen, ignoring air resistance. Let me say it one more time. The rock is pulled down with a higher force. This is true. However, it, it takes longer for it to, I shouldn't say it takes longer. It takes, um, it, it, it has more inertia, so it's more difficult to get it moving. It, in other words, it takes more of a force to get the rock moving in the first place. So yes, the rock has more force pulling down, but it takes more force to get the rock moving at exactly the same rate as what happens with the marker. The marker has less force acting down, but less resistance to motion. In other words, it's very easy to move this marker and it's very hard to move the rock. The rock has more force, the uh, marker has less force, but the rock is harder to move, but it has more force. But the marker is easier to move and it has less gravitational force. And everything balances out so that 
everything falls at exactly the same rate. And we can see that in the uh, video from the moon. And we can also do that experiment on the ground in a vacuum chamber as well. In fact, you can do it yourself. If you just pick things that are easy, like a penny, grab a, 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 a coin and grab a rock from outside. Neither of those is gonna be affected by air resistance too much. Something very heavy, something like a, a coin, and then hold it out and just drop it. And you will see that they both hit the ground at, at the same time to within whatever error you can observe it with your eyes. All right, so now what I'd like to do is we know how, uh, we know how it works as far as, um, we know how it works as far as what acceleration is. Let's just do one or two quick little calculations. They're very, very simple, just to give you a feel for how to calculate it. Here we go. Uh, a car starts from rest and it reaches 90 kilometers per hour in seven seconds. What is the acceleration in meters per second squared? So we have an immediate problem right away because the uh, uh, we start at rest, but then we go up to 90 kilometers per hour Kilometers is the unit of distance and hours is the unit of time, but we want the acceleration in meters per second. So the very first thing we have to do to calculate this is we need to turn that 90 kilometers per hour into meters per second so we have the same unit. So the way we do it is we put 90 kilometers on the top and we put hours on the bottom. This is 90 kilometers per hour and we have to convert to meters per second. So we do it in a step-by-step -step fashion. What's the conversion factor from kilometers to meters? We say one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters. And I put the kilometer on the bottom because I want it to cancel. Remember, when things divide away, what I'm going to end up doing is multiplying and dividing all these things, and the units cancel just like everything else. So if I have kilometers on the top and the bottom, they divide away, and now I have a unit of meters per hour. If I were to multiply by 1,000 like this, I would have meters per hour. But I don't want meters per hour, I want meters per second. So I have to write another conversion factor. One hour is 60 minutes. And I put the hours on the top so it would cancel like this. And if I were to stop the calculation now, I would have meters per minute. But I don't want meters per minute, I want meters per second. So I have to put some minutes on the top, one minute on the top, and 60 seconds on the bottom. Minutes cancel, you arrange your conversion factors to cancel. And now, if I stop the calculations, I will have meters per second. Everything else is gone. Now, how do I carry out the, cal the actual calculation? Well, I take the 90, multiply by 1,000, divide by 1, multiply by 1, divide by 60, multiply by 1, divide by 60. When you run all that through a calculator, you get 25 meters per second. All right, 25 meters per second. So now the problem has changed. Instead of that weird unit we had to begin with, it's like a car starts from rest, and then it reaches a final velocity of 25 meters per second over a period of time of seven, seven, seven seconds. What is its acceleration? So we have to go back to the uh, equation for acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in the time. But velocity is basically the final velocity minus the initial velocity. And the time is the final timestamp minus the initial timestamp. There's nothing that changed direction. We're just looking at basically how the speed changes here. The final velocity is 25 meters per second. And the initial velocity, it says it starts from rest, which is zero meters per second. The final time is seven seconds into the future. The initial time we say is zero. That's when the clock starts. And so what we have is 25 on the top and seven on the bottom. And when you take 25 and divide by seven, you get an acceleration, an average acceleration is what it is, of 3.6. And what are your units gonna be? It's meters per second on the top divided by seconds on the bottom, which is exactly what we expect, meters per second squared, which means that this car is accelerating 3.6 meters per second per second. So that means that after the first second, it's going 3.6 meters per second. And every second thereafter, it's increasing its speed by that much, eventually reaching a maximum of 25 meters per second. That's an acceleration in the direction of motion. All right, so it's speeding up. The positive sign here means it's accelerating to the right in the same direction that it's traveling. All right, I'm gonna do one last one. Uh, and it basically says a car traveling at 30 kilometers per hour breaks to a stop in one second. What is the acceleration in meters per second? So this is the same thing. It's just a different initial and a different final velocity. So what we have to do is look at what they gave us. They told us, or I told you, that we're traveling 30 kilometers per hour. We don't want to use that unit because we want the acceleration in meters per second. That's in the problem statement. So we have to do the same exact conversion factor we did here. We can work with kilometers. We can say one kilometer 
is 1,000 meters, so the kilometers will cancel. And then we can work with hours. We can say that one hour is 60 minutes, and then the hours cancel. But we don't want meters per minute, so what we do is we say that one minute is 60 seconds, so that the minutes on the top and the bottom cancel. Now the units I have are meters per second. All right, so then, how do I do it? I say 30 times 1,000 divided by 1 times 1 divided by 60 times 1 divided by 60, and what you get is 8.3 meters per second. Now, it actually, there's some more decimals here. I'm rounding to 8.3 meters per second. Now, what is this? This is the velocity given in the problem statement. A car is traveling at 30 kilometers per hour. We've converted that to meters per second, but then it breaks. So, the average acceleration is the final velocity minus the initial velocity over the final time minus the initial uh, time. That's the initial time there, yeah. What is the final velocity? Well, this is a car that stops. So the final velocity is actually zero meters per second. The initial velocity is what we started with. We just converted that. So we say minus 8.3, that's in meters per second. What is the final time? It says it takes one second, so that's the final timestamp. The initial timestamp is zero. And so what do I have? On the top, 0 minus 8.3 is negative 8.3. On the bottom, you just have 1. And so what do you get? Negative 8.3, what are the units? Meters per second on the top, seconds on the bottom. So you get meters per second squared. Notice that we got a negative acceleration, which just means that we're decelerating. And it tells us the car is already traveling at some speed, and then it comes to rest. So we know it has to decelerate, so we expect the acceleration to be negative, and that's what we got. So basically, the way this situation goes is you have some car here, like this, it's an awesome looking car, right? And initially, it's traveling forward at 8.3 meters per second, like this, 8.3 meters per second. But then later on, the car actually comes to rest. So it's something like this, like this, and now the velocity is zero. So it stopped at a red light, right? The velocity is zero, this is at rest. And this is a time period of one second later. Right? And so the only way that this can happen is for there to be a deceleration, which is a negative acceleration of negative, so I'll put it right here, A is equal to negative 8.3 meters per second squared. All this means is the car slows down at a rate of 8.3 meters per second every second. And since we know it only took one second to come to rest and it was traveling with this speed, it must have decreased its speed by exactly this much to get to zero. So it makes sense. I intentionally choose not difficult problems. I don't want to squish your brain into mush, I just want you to understand what acceleration is. So to sum up, acceleration is to change your velocity over some period of time. But as I said in the beginning, velocity is a vector, and that means there's really two ways to accelerate. The only thing we talked about here is speeding up or slowing down over time. Uh, but there's another way to get an acceleration to change your direction, and we're going to cover that in a future lesson. So I'd like you to Review this and follow me on to the next uh, lesson where we'll continue learning together.